there's a big difference even from saying the superstars get calls. Superstars get calls is something that I think you can say. And that means what it means. Because superstars can be anywhere. LeBron James became the biggest star in basketball playing in Cleveland. That's not a quote-unquote big market. Not by the way we define those things in the NBA. Kevin Durant became one of the biggest stars in the league playing in Oklahoma City. That, I think, might be the smallest market in the NBA. Uh, John Morant, all these guys, they're in, they're in small markets, and they get calls because superstars get calls, and I think that's fair game. I think coaches saying afterwards, I'm sick of the superstars getting all the calls, that I can see the strategy of that. Because what you're saying is you want a particular eye now on Michael Jordan pushing off or on anything else that you want the officials to at least consider calling. But when you say what he said last night, what you're essentially saying is the league wants the Knicks to win, that there is an actual conspiracy, an active conspiracy here for the big market team to win. And it's not so much that I have a problem with it, because who cares if I have a problem with it, but if I'm Adam Silver, I have a real problem with that. And it should be reminded to everyone, I have been having these fights with people. I remember Mike and I started, what was the year of the game that the Lakers beat Sacramento on the road in game seven and the world went crazy, crazy. The officiating in that game was terribly one-sided. That was 2000 or, that was 2000, yes. Okay. 2002. Two. The King series was 02? Wh yep. Whatever year it was. It was 02. It was very, very early Mike and Mike. And we were, the, the reason I'm saying that is that we weren't a big enough show yet that David Stern would come on our show then. He would come on many times. He came on all the time years later and I loved him. Um, but he didn't come on our show then. But I remember taking call after call after email after email because this was before there was such a thing as Twitter from fans saying, the league's, it's fixed, it's fixed, it's fixed. I mean, I, I could give you a, a bunch of different quotes, but they all add up to the same thing. It's fixed, it's fixed, it's fixed, it's fixed. And David Stern recognized he had a problem. And I think Adam recognizes that too. These games are not fixed, folks. They're not. Okay, I, I mean, Mike and I sat there and yelled and screamed this. They are not. Are there bad calls? Yes. Was there a rogue ref, Tim Donaghy? Who yes. Is it possible that that happens again? Sure. Did the, the player who, what was his name? Uh, uh, Michael Porter's brother. Uh, John Tay? John Tay Porter. Terrible. Do those things happen? Yes. Is there a league orchestrated uh, conspiracy to make sure the teams they want to win, win, absolutely not just think about what you're actually saying that in these there are meetings going on in these well i don't know what it is you're imagining some dark room on what park avenue <laughs> fifth avenue these, these aren't these aren't taking place in secret places and they're actually deciding that on the basis of one season's television ratings over the course of two weeks we're going to risk and or a, 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 a league and every business in it that is worth billions and billions and billions of dollars it's laughable if you really think about it but it's a problem that people think it and it is the reason that we have the transparency of the two-minute report which everybody hates Everybody hates the two-minute report. We can't agree on anything in this world anymore, except that everyone hates the two-minute report. But this is the reason they do it. And this is the reason they have to. So for Rick Carlisle to say, we got screwed, which he definitely did in game one, I have no issue with. And I don't think that, I mean, they don't like the refs getting called out, but that is what it is. And that's, that's kind of a no harm, no foul, if you will excuse the unintended pun. Um... For him to say the superstars are getting the calls, Jalen Brunson's getting it, all those things are different. For him to say a small market team deserves a fair shot, you're a person who is now adding, you have now given all of the conspiracy theorists like a ledge to hold on to. Like I'm imagining if you're a conspiracy theorist and you're like trying to climb up the mountain of conspiracy, you need to find a place, you need to find footing, right? You need to find a spot. Ooh, I can grab onto this, I can grab onto that. Ooh, I just found something. Rick Carlisle just said the league doesn't want small market teams winning. That's what he said. And I think that's a problem. I, I, I think he's going to get fined substantially for it. He doesn't care. He did it purposely. I get it. I get why he's doing it. I don't think he believes it. But I think that's kind of the one place you can't go. You're 100% right. And he almost discredits himself by saying the very last thing that he said. Because up until that point, 
everything that Rick Carlisle said was between the you know the twenty yard lines. They did get screwed in game one. I think almost anyone, even Knicks fans like yourself, would acknowledge as much down the stretch. They definitely got an unfavorable whistle. But in the end, you just can't go there. Right now, there's a 39-33 to 33 foul disparity in the, in the series. The Pacers have been called for six more. It's certainly not a, a huge difference. You can point to any number of plays in practically any game and say, that's the right call and that's the wrong call. Brian Windhorst told us on Get Up this morning that they're sending 78 plays to the league office overnight to complain about this stuff. We're talking about nearly one per minute. Like it doesn't, you, you've, you've taken it too far at that point. I think he needs to spend a lot more time worrying about the fact that his team can't play defense and a little less time worrying about the officiating. Their in this defense series. sucks. Their defense is so bad. They gave up 130 points to a team that wants to score 90. <laughs> right? The, the Knicks have not scored. The Knicks have not scored 130 points in a playoff game in 34 years. Can we look this up? Has Tom Thibodeau ever had a team score 130 I will look points that up. in a playoff game? Ever? I got a couple more numbers for you. <laughs> so they allowed 130 points, like you said. It was only a 92 possession game. That's 1.4 points per possession. By that measure, it's the worst defensive performance by any team in any game this postseason. The Knicks, after halftime in two games, have scored 139 points, shooting 60% from the field, 54% from three. 60% from the field. Let that sink in a minute. 48 minutes of basketball, 60% from the field. Let me go look up that Tibbs note for you now. I mean, if you think about that, if you shoot 68% from the field over the entirety of a 48-point game, you're a 48-minute game, you're going to score, I don't know, 130 points, <laughs> which is what they gave up last night. And that's the reason they lost last night. Now, I don't have a problem with Rick complaining about the officiating because they got screwed like nobody's business in game one. And he had two legitimate gripes last night that have nothing to do with market size. One, they missed a a blatant two-hand push to the back on Halliburton, who has a bad back from Josh Hart on a play in transition. He was enraged about that, and he should have been. The second is he did not like that they overturned. I keep using the word overturned, and it sounds like it was challenged, which it was not. They changed their minds. I don't know what the official term for this is. On the Hartenstein double dribble, which wasn't, they got the call right after getting it wrong. They did that without a challenge being used or anything else. That is after they didn't do that. They didn't correct it ex post facto on the kickball the first night with, was it Neesmith? No, I mean, whoever the hell kicked the ball, but they called it a kickball and it wasn't. So, so those are the things that he's mad about. And he's 100% right to be mad about them. Like, bad calls happen. That's always a part of a playoff series. And in a close playoff series, sometimes the losing team can feel and the fans can feel like the officiating went a long way towards deciding it. That absolutely happens. No one is suggesting otherwise. I've seen it. You've seen it. We've all seen it. It happens in all sports. The umpiring in baseball is a joke. I mean, b balls and strikes in baseball is the most ludicrous thing I've ever seen. It's never been worse than it is right now. In football, we've seen incredibly significant playoff games decided by bad calls. The most famous one being New Orleans and um, mm -hmm. the Rams in the NFC Championship game. This stuff happens. Don't, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting up here saying officials don't get things wrong and it doesn't have a significant impact on the outcome. Of course that happens. I'm just saying there is not a league orchestrated campaign to make sure the Knicks get past Indiana so that ESPN's ratings in the Eastern Conference Finals are whatever they would be, 8% higher, you know, in, in the last two weeks of May. That's just not what's happening. Here. Tom Thibodeau has now coached 80 playoff games in his head coaching career. Yesterday was the first time any one of his teams ever scored even 125 points in a regulation yeah, game. Yeah, I mean, it, it, of course, because they, that's not his, how his teams work. So let me get Bubba and Cam in on this. Bubs, you've been with me for a lot of the, my time on the radio here at ESPN Radio, not all, but a lot of it. What is your perspective on what Carlisle said? Do you have an issue with it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, anytime you're bringing in the essentially the rigged portion of it, I would say I have an issue with it. I'm sure, in the, for the most part, he's just trying to stick up for his players, which I get, but... I'm with you. Anytime you're kind of going down the rig path, I'm I'm not a fan of that because it just opens up too much stuff to all the, the the lunatic fringe, if you will, who does who do, who will buy into that, and they'll just start breaking down all these videos and stuff. Oh, look there, it is rigged. Look at that call right there. 
But I, I go back to what what Jay Will said on on uh, you know get up earlier today. The Pacers need to play better. Like it's not a, it's not a, a ref problem. Sure, there were missed calls, and I'm sure there were missed calls from both sides. But when you look at the amount of you know players that are missing on the Knicks side and the bad defense the Pacers are playing, the Pacers have been in these games and they just need to play better. And they actually could have won both of these games if they just stepped up and played better. Cam. Yeah, so many of the teams left are small to mid market teams. So why did they get this far if they're not getting, you know, all the all the favorable calls? So I think the implication is kind of weird and I think he was probably just heated in the moment. He kept his cool after game one, but then when he felt that they were wronged again after game two, he felt like he should speak up. But I think he took it maybe a step too far by you know, putting in something uh, into people's heads that shouldn't be there. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. I think what, when he puts that out there, the only thing I disagree with you on, Cam, is that was not a spontaneous moment of frustration. That was calculated. Mm-hmm. These coaches, a huge part of their job is what they say after the games and how they're planning on it influencing what happens in the next game. So he definitely made a, a conscious decision to do that. And, and look, maybe that's trying to galvanize his fans, like the fans in Indiana, to go nuts on Friday night, which they're going to do anyway. Listen, anyone who's ever been to a basketball game in Indiana knows those fans are unbelievable. There will not, let me put it this way. There will not be MVP chance for Jalen Brunson at the free throw line <laughs> hey, in Indianapolis. It's it. not going to happen. Low it's blow. just not going to happen. Well, I'm, I'm it's just not. What, that kind it, of thing just doesn't happen in Indiana. Yeah, it's, it's it just, does in Philly. It, it, it just happened in Philly. <laughs> yeah. It will not happen in Indiana. Those fans are nuts. And they're, they're, they're but it actually is a whole separate conversation because I'm just kind of going through it. Cam just made me think of something. The future of the NBA, at least in this moment, is very small market heavy. Yeah. Right? So if you think about who are the big stars, the big young stars, like LeBron's in a big market, do we consider Phoenix a big market? I, uh, forgetting that. It's a mid. Uh, obviously, San Francisco is a big market, and, and, they're, and they're big traditional. By the market, I also mean like the traditional powerhouse teams, right? Like, like you know, I don't even know what number market Boston is, but there is no bigger NBA market than Boston. The, the NBA is built on Boston and Los Angeles first right, and foremost. It's 11th, but and it's... And then it extends from there. Yeah. Well, in the NBA, it's second. Right, of course. Um, and, you know, but, but but we all know what the big markets are, right? New York, Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think about think about where the great young stars in the NBA are right now, Nikola Jokic is in Denver. John Morant, who I think does count and will be remembered again next year, is in Memphis. That's 28th. Zion Williamson 27th. is in New Orleans. Anthony Edwards is in Minneapolis. They're more of a mid-market. Yeah, that, that's a bigger mm-hmm. city, but it is a, a, an organization, a franchise with no history whatsoever. Right. right. They have no history. Giannis is in Milwaukee. 25th. Um, Shea. Who else? Shea Gilgis Alexander is in OKC. 26th. Uh, at, at market in the NBA. Mm-hmm. What's 30th? Well, the Raptors don't count because we don't. Oh, they I don't count. You. They don't right. contribute to so, our. So that we're counting twenty nine. Yeah. So what, well, I'm only 20? no, I'm only saying twenty eight on the list because oh, okay. we, well, because there are there are two teams in L A. Oh, and and there are two teams in New York too, technically. Yeah, technically, right. Yeah. So so you've got that. Okay, sorry. So I guess the point I'm making is get used to it. Wemba Nyama. Uh, Wemby is now in San Antonio. Twenty fourth. I mean, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, Ben Carroll. It's a point well made. Yeah. So, so the point I mean, is, most of them really. The, the the future of the NBA is going to it, a lot of it feels right now like it's going to be small market heavy. Now, are these guys going to go sign in big markets? We'll find out. If they want to win. When they get <laughs> According to Rick Carlisle. Yeah, if, if you ask Rick Carlisle, they all will. <laughs> 